Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank everybody for being here at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. Give yourself a round of applause for being present and, and awake and looking great. Uh, my name is Christian Perry. I am the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Partnership for College Completion. And I'm going to do something real obnoxious because uh, my caffeine's kicking in. I'm going to ask my team to stand. Uh, so Mike, Giselle, Caitlin, Sonian, Danielle, yep, and you guys can clap for them. These are the phenomenal individuals um, that I always say I am gifted to stay out of their way so that they can do the incredible work of, of moving equity forward in higher education. Um, so I'm providing a welcome here from, from, from the PCC side. Uh, we, we are proud to lead in partnership uh, with our core partners across this work, the Coalition for Transformation in Higher Education. And this is our, so yeah, right, this is our first, this is our first listening session um, at Governor's State. And we're grateful to be here. We're grateful to Governor's State for allowing us the space. I learned a little bit of PCC history that one of the earliest events uh, that PCC had ever done was on this campus, and I believe even in this room, uh, PCC will turn eight soon, so that's a big deal uh, to be retracing our steps in this work uh, with great partners like Governor State, so we're, we're very grateful for that. Um, so just a brief overview of the day, we're gonna talk about um, the bill itself. We have one of our co-sponsors and co-chairs here uh, who will also provide um, some information on the bill as well as uh, our phenomenal partners in research and data from PCC and Advance Illinois uh, will kind of take us through a data walk to help understand and make the case for what it is we're trying to do with SB 3965. Um, but with that, I will bring up, I believe I'm bringing up, I'm looking at my notes, hold on one second, and my glasses were not cleaned off. So I will be bringing up Dr. Janelle Crowley from GSU to offer uh, welcome, welcoming remarks from Governor State University. Well, good morning and welcome everyone. On behalf of President Green, who cannot be here today, she is just so sad that she's not here today because this is her passion. And she has very graciously uh, worked on the adequacy um, commission and she's just, um, she really wanted to be here today. So I wanna thank um, Representative Ammons for being here today, thank you so much. And also, would everyone from Gov State please take a stand for a moment? Because this is an amazing campus. So this, this all started for us a long time ago. Um, but in 2017, yes, that's when it started here, uh, when we really started working towards equity. So on behalf of President Green and Governor State University, I warmly welcome all of you to the first critical listening session. Um, we gather here as part of um, a statewide initiative mandated by the Public Act 102.0570, um, which really pushed this forward. And now we have some wonderful partners in this room who are really helping us to move it forward and to shape the future. And this is so important and everyone looks at equity in different lenses and I was one of those non-traditionals on many different levels. So um, I speak on behalf of everyone that I am partnered with, especially from the deaf community as well. As we embark on these discussions today, I strongly encourage everyone to really share your insights, share your experiences and the vision. This is something that we live in and we breathe day in and day out here at Governor's State. And we see it that our goal is more clear and we are getting closer to everyone understanding the financial importance of what's going on in the state of Illinois. And we have an opportunity like what we say here at Gov State, we transform lives. And moving through the day, um, let's seize the moment today um, to make lasting and positive impact on higher education and in President Green's words, we must. So, and I would like to make a, I would like to say good morning again to Will Davis. Thank you, Representative, for being here this morning. Thank you, very honored to have you here. So, um, we really thank you. Um, it is crucial today, so um, 
everyone just um, take the moment and let's transform lives today. Thank you. All right, another hand for Governor State for being such a gracious host. And Dr. Crowley. Um, so this is gonna be a jam-packed day. Um, we're gonna move through a lot of information. Um, if you haven't already, I believe every table has a scannable QR code that'll pull up the agenda for you. Feel free to pull out your phone um, and engage with that. Um, but we're gonna walk through the impact. We're gonna have a panel discussion where we talk about the, the why and the how, uh, and then we'll have some call to actions before, before we close and allow everybody to enjoy a good lunch. Um, before I bring up our next presenters, I'm gonna talk us through um, a little bit of the timeline. Uh, this, is, this work has been going on um, for some time. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Folks that have been around Advance, PCC, um, partners in the work, um, know how long it has taken for the conversation to, to shift, to be able to do this in a way that's fruitful um, and has a chance of getting done. So back in 2021, um, per the pillars that were passed by the Black Caucus, this commission was formed to take a look at this um, because Illinois was unique in this way um, by not having a funding formula for the public higher education system. Um, although it had one on the community college side, didn't have one on the four-year side. So the commission began to meet. Uh, they looked at a ton of different models from across the country. Um, our data and research wizards, uh, as well as folks from HCM and all the commissioners uh, dug in. Uh, and I came into this work pretty much a little bit more than halfway through the end um, and just hearing the robustness um, and the vitality that was in every one of these conversations, the thoughtful questions that were asked, the side groups that had to be stood up with different technical modeling groups to ensure uh, that Illinois got it right, uh, that we didn't just copy and paste and do what other states had done, but we took this opportunity to do something transformative. Um, so after those technical modeling groups and all these different work, work group sessions, um, we were able to finalize recommendations. Um, and once those recommendations were finalized, uh, we had a really fantastic press conference um, with Senator Leifer, Representative Ammons. Um, a lot of our core partners were there uh, where we announced uh, via press release um, the actual recommendations and forecasted that these recommendations would be put into bill form uh, and drafted into a bill. Um, from there, while that drafting was taking place, we had some really fruitful committee hearings, uh, subject matter hearings on equitable funding, uh, engaged with a ton of members down in Springfield during PCC's first ever advocacy day. We were able to take about 60 folks down, a group of students, higher ed practitioners, uh, and partners in the work, faculty and staff, to be able to talk, talk to legislators directly about how this impacts them, why they know that higher education needs to be funded um, equitably and adequately. And since July, uh, we've been doing the work via this vehicle, uh, via the coalition, to not only begin to build capacity, uh, we have great partners in the room like Hope Chicago. We work very closely with Chicago Scholars. Um, a lot of our college access groups uh, and beginning to make those inroads in the business community as well to, to build a table that is well representative of all the interests that benefit from a fully funded higher education system. Um, so that bill has been drafted. Um, we are in the midst of negotiations. Those things have just started. And now uh, I'm gonna ask for Mike and EO to come up and they're gonna walk you through uh, in a great deal of detail uh, as far as the substance um, of the bill and what we're trying to accomplish with SB 3965. Uh, so give Mike and EO a round of applause as they come. Thanks for the welcome, Christian. Uh, as, as Christian said, my name is Eo Viamogas. I'm a part of the policy team at Advance Illinois. And I'll let Mike introduce himself. Hi, I'm Mike Abrahamson from the Partnership for College Completion. And really thankful for everyone to take the time to be here today. Uh, but without further ado, let's launch into uh, why we're here. Great, this works. Um, <laughs> to start, I'm gonna remind us um, of, of why we're here and the problem that we're facing. Simply put, Illinois has an inequitable, inadequate, and unstable funding for universities. And this funding, this inequitable, inadequate, uh, unstable funding approach uh, in universities is driven, is, is hindered by several different issues. First of all, the current approach is simply uh, 
not, does not have any funding formula underneath it. So that means that it does not take into consideration student need, institutional need, institutional mission, or even something as simple as the number of students that go to a university. Furthermore, uh, the current funding approach is largely driven by political negotiations. So that means that the amount of resources that institutions receive is largely at the whim of political and budgetary pressures in Springfield. And so year over year, the amount of funding can ebb and it can flow. Uh, and over the last 10 years, to be frank, it's ebbed more than it's flowed. Uh, and, and furthermore, that this funding bakes in inequities as year over year the funding is done and across the board increases and decreases, widening the gap between what some institutions have and what others have. Hold on to that for a moment because we're going to come back to that point in a later slide. But all of these issues in the funding approach has led to instability in the form of disinvestment. And unfortunately, Illinois has been an outlier to this effect. Uh, and whenever you look at the percent of state revenue spent on higher education, Illinois has declined precipitously from 13% in the early 90s to just 2%, whereas the rest of the country has held relatively stable at about 14%. Uh, and whenever you look at specifically the amount of real dollars that are going to universities, we see that the public university appropriation has declined by nearly 50%. Half. And in that same time period, public institution uh, tuition and the cost of tuition has more than doubled in that same time period. As public universities have tried to fill budgetary pressures caused by the, the decline in appropriation with tuition and fees. So essentially the cost of universities has been pushed onto students over the last two decades. Now this increasing cost of tuition and the uh, decline of affordability has significant issues. And whenever we look at the, the issues of the lack of appropriation to institutions, uh, to high need institutions or institutions that are underfunded relative to others, we see that it causes a significant impact on what is those institutions are able to offer the students that attend those universities. So I mentioned before that our funding approach bakes in inequities and asked you to hold on to that thought. Whenever we look at how much institutions spend in academic and non-academic student spending, this is everything from tutoring to career services to mental health services, things that have a real impact on students' experiences on campus and help them persist unto graduation. We see that across Illinois that there is a $5,500 gap per student in the amount that's able to be spent across the universities on these services. And what's worse is that this gap is actually increasing over the last decade, going up to over $7,500 per student. That means that the gap has widened by nearly 50% over the last decade. And something that's even more, I guess, damaging or problem, problematic in this is that the students that, or that the universities that uh, have fewer resources to spend on their students for these academic and non-academic services, a greater portion of their population are underrepresented minorities, meaning black, Latinx students, and also have a higher rate of Pell students and students from simply under-resourced backgrounds. And we know that these are students that would have an outsized benefit from having these additional resources. So the students that would benefit most from these services, unfortunately, at universities, or the universities that serve those students have the fewest resources to do that. This is the broadening gap that uh, disinvestment has created uh, for, for the student's impact. And whenever we look at institutions, this uh, increasing gap in terms of funding has also led to affordability challenges for students. Uh, affordability has been instrumental in the enrollment declines at our regional universities, which have declined by more than a quarter, nearly a third uh, over the last decade. Now, recent, recently, Illinois became the second most expensive state to send a student for public university. Something, though, that is, that is good news is that over the last few years, through a, a, a lauded effort by the Pritzker administration and the General Assembly, the amount that has been appropriated to public universities has increased. And as a result of that, 
we see that uh, we're finally turning around these enrollment declines and there's been a 5% increase in the last two years. And that tells us that investment works, that we see the impact that it has and how it enables institutions to increase their enrollment and it enables institutions to meet those affordability challenges that students face. <clears throat> now, whenever we're now we recognize that funding works, but it's also important that we pause and remind ourselves what we mean whenever we're talking about a healthy public university system. We are in fact talking about funding in two forms. One, institutional funding. And these are, this is the funding that goes directly to institutions to support their operations or the programming that they do to support students, as well as the instruction that happens there. Uh, and also, this is in the form of direct financial aid that goes to students to help them meet the cost of attendance so that they can matriculate and step onto campus. We need both to ensure that students have access to university and that once they get there, the universities that serve them are effectively resourced to support them onto graduation. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. The data really backs this up. Uh, it's, it, it, the data shows that a 10% increase in investment in higher education increases fall enrollment, shortens time to degree, and increases persistence in graduation rates. And what's better is that all of these benefits, that there's an outsized impact for students from under-resourced backgrounds and black and Latinx students. So that means that this increased funding not only improves the situation for our students, but it also closes equity gaps in graduation, in enrollment, and in retention. Now, we know what's at stake whenever we disinvest. We've lived that life for the last 20 years, but now we have an opportunity to, to, to find what it looks like to fund our universities. And I'm actually gonna pass it off to Mike to share a little bit about the innovative solution that Illinois has. Awesome. Thanks, Eo. Uh, yes, I am very excited, uh, as my team knows too well, to talk about this solution, uh, which is a groundbreaking one, and how we can actually adequately, equitably, stably fund our universities with increased accountability, which those are essentially our guiding principles, right? How do we um, build this model, particularly with the, the history of uh, funding universities, um, which isn't always necessarily a positive one. I'll get into that a little bit. And how do we do this in a way that builds a unique accountability and transparency for new funding spent? How do we actually operationalize that? Well, we worked for, I think, two and a half years in the commission, and I actually think landed in a, uh, on a really amazing set of solutions, which we're now figuring out the details on and talking through. I'll try to explain it in the simplest way I can, though I will admit it's not necessarily extremely simple. Um, I do think it makes sense. Uh, and essentially what it does is it looks at, as a system, what do we need in terms of investment to get our overall graduation rate from where it is now, around 63%, to closer to 70% uh, aggregate graduation rate. Uh, to do that, we looked at different types of expenses. We broke them down uh, into what fuels access to our universities, academic and student supports, core instruction, mission of each university, their operations and maintenance, et cetera. Those are the green and orange categories you can see here. We looked at the research that Eob just pointed to on what does additional spending actually do in terms of increasing outcomes for our students. But then we also looked at retention and access disparities uh, by all sorts of different subgroup, uh, so subgroups of students. And we also looked at the research there on what does it take to support those students to narrow and eliminate those gaps. That results in those equity adjustments, that blue bar on top of there, right? It's not just enough to fund across the board. Uh, we have to look at the specific students' populations that uh, we need to bring equitable funding uh, toward. So just as a you know, quick example, if your institution enrolled 2,000 students from low-income backgrounds who receive Pell Grants, um, you would, uh, the institution would receive not just the funding they've gotten in the past for those six categories, but the additional funding we, need, we know is needed to raise everyone's retention or access and retention rates, right? But also, we look at those 2,000 students from low-income backgrounds and uh, the research that shows that 
that you need more funding per student to actually serve those students well, and you add those equity adjustments on top. Through that, we end up with an adequacy target for each university. You combine all of those and you have the adequacy target for the system. That's this $1.4 billion additional funding that I'll get to later. Um, well, actually, that's after you subtract step two, which is looking at the resources universities already have access to. The most obvious one there is our current state appropriations. Um, current state appropriations, uh, right now, there's a hold harmless for those, right? No institution is going to see their funding cut after, as EO mentioned, decades of seeing funding cut. Um, and also, it's not just about the, uh, about turning that around, it's also, we did the math on this and don't believe any university is at adequate funding. So it doesn't make sense to cut any university, right? Um, so, but we do need to, because we, especially because we know that every institution isn't funded uh, equitably or even equally, we have to look at what universities currently get from the state as part of their resources. Um, more controversially, we have other revenue sources here, which include, or mostly our endowment. This is one of the areas that we're still working out. There are robust discussions around this, but uh, as it was modeled, those uh, an institution's 4.2% of an institution's endowment, uh, which is what's calculated as what you can spend per year on students, is in the formula. Um, again, being discussed more. And finally, equitable student share. This is maybe the least intuitive part of the formula, but it's very important, um, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, why not just, when you're looking at the resources that a university has, why not just look at the tuition and fees they collect? That's a huge part of what they have, right? Well, yes, it's actually too much. We, as Eob showed in all these slides, um, we're seeing these enrollment declines and lack of ability to serve students because we know with this investment, we've had to charge too much to these students. If we were gonna look at that as a stable, expected revenue source, what we would be doing is baking in the very inequity into this formula that we're trying to correct for. Instead, we have a uh, expected student share. Once again, we look at the demographics of each university that they enroll, and we calculate based off of those subgroups, what can a university actually reasonably expect to collect from those students, and that calculation is what goes into the model currently. That is another area that we're still talking about, um, and there's, there's you know, many of those areas, but uh, as we're working out this formula. So finally, you subtract step one, how much resources each university needs from step two, uh, how much they currently have, and you have that adequacy gap, you add it all up to the or for every university, that's that $1.4 billion that I'll be talking about more. Um, it's also really important how we distribute those funding, that funding, right? We know that all of this isn't gonna come about next year, uh, necessarily, so um, we have to look at how close institutions are to adequacy when we look at how to give out funding every year. Here you can see one institution's at 45% of adequacy, another's at 92% of adequacy. One has about $11,000 to spend per student, uh, another has 20,000, and then if you look at the very top, you'll see that the, the university at a lower percentage of adequacy actually needs more than the university closer to adequacy because, again, that's calculated not across the board, but based on what students you enroll. So um, right now, the allocation is based on two factors. One, how far you are from adequacy, both in terms of percentage and dollar amount, and then also another debated topic of should there be a guardrail also in there to make sure that, uh, to see that universities um, across the board get some level of funding with increases. Um, the last thing I'll point out here is again that 92% of adequacy is not 100% of adequacy. It's not 200% of adequacy. We don't believe any university is currently at adequacy, um, but it really matters how we distribute that additional funding um, and how we prioritize that as a state. One of the areas that uh, I'm most excited about, I don't know if I can really put, you know, I'm excited about all this stuff obviously, but uh, accountability in this system is critical and actually like, uh, one of the biggest issues with how um, public university funding is currently doled out around the country. We had, I think, three or four other states come in throughout the course of the commission and talk to us. And in none of those, I don't think we came away with, oh, this is the model to use. And a lot of that comes down to accountability. There are fundamental contradictions in performance or outcomes-based funding that we try to address in this formula. Uh, a couple of them that I'll mention are timing. Most of these outcomes and performance-based models, which is where most of the innovation has been around this funding model, what they do is they 
give, they give a university a target and they say, if you want more funding, you have to hit that target. Let's say, increase your graduation rate by 5% and we'll give you more funding. Well, we know that's not how that works, particularly for underfunded institutions. They need that funding to increase those rates. That's what all the research says. What ends up happening is they either get level funded or they get cut. Um, we also know that those kinds of hard metrics, like increase by 5%, can actually be counterproductive. It can lead to perverse incentives because just having that hard metric, it's, it's a hard and complex process for universities to actually increase their graduation rate. They can do it, but more funding is needed. What universities, especially ones that already um, have more resources can do to actually raise that rate, and unfortunately the research shows that this is what happens, is they enroll different selection of students to meet that, right? They enroll fewer students that they maybe deem might be less likely to graduate, the research shows that ends up being fewer students uh, from low-income backgrounds and fewer students of color. Uh, so it actually works against our goals. A holistic review, which this accountability mechanism would suggest uh, instead, um, would have stakeholders all get together as part of committees um, and review uh, um, goals that are aligned with the state and institutional goals and uh, determine through a more holistic process um, are institutions actually meeting what they need to be doing uh, and, uh, or are they meeting goals to, and not just to the letter of the law, right? Uh, finally, effective and equitable consequences. Um, I mentioned that, oh, you don't get to that 5% graduation rate, you get your funding cut. That's something we see in a lot of outcomes and performance-based models, which end up hurting the very institutions we're trying to help. Uh, instead, I, we envision a model that saves fund, pausing funding as a last option and instead brings more evidence-based solutions that can actually help students. Things like increased reporting, uh, increased uh, accountability for scaling best practices, um, and other, uh, other actions like that um, from the state that aren't necessarily going to end up hurting students. Um, those this could all work out into different categories that could be scaled in over time. I'm not gonna get to spend too much time on this, but you know, you can't immediately be, like let's, again, six year graduation rates. You can't say, hey, tomorrow we increase our six year graduation rates. You usually can't say that because it's six years. It takes a long time, right? Even if everything is, the funding's there and you're doing everything right. What you can say immediately is, hey, you got this new funding. Are you spending it in ways that benefit students? Are you increasing affordability, which we know from the charts that EOB shows are a top priority, particularly at our institutions that have been underfunded over the last couple decades? Um, or is that leading to increased enrollment, which we know we need to see as a state as to reverse those trends? And then finally, being responsible for increasing outcomes like retention rates and ultimately graduation rates. Um, there are a lot of areas that are still being discussed. I'm not going to go into all of these, but uh, you know you can get the slides um, and, and look through some of these areas that are being hotly debated. I do want to leave some time for questions, though. Um, similarly, this just shows the different articles of the legislation of SB 3965. I'm not going to go through this, but you can read through the legislation and uh, through these different um, how it's structured. What I will show is what the projections of this additional funding would look like. The blue is current resources that institutions already have. The orange is adequacy gaps. One th and then the orange, the red to yellow kind of at the bottom shows how close are these institutions to adequacy. One thing you can do is just eyeball the institutions with the, the darkest, you know, the red uh, at the bottom are receiving um, the, you know, more resources to be adequately funded, right? You can also see that all institutions are getting increases um, uh, along with what I was saying before, but you can really see both how the, that additional funding would be split up uh, and then the prioritization that's necessary uh, to get each institution to equitable funding. Um, so, $1.4 billion, I've said that a couple times, it's a number that's getting thrown around a lot because that's what's calculated as needed average additional investment. That would bring us back to around where we were in terms of annual funding for our public universities when in the um, early 2000s, I believe, uh, was, was around there. We've done the projecting, looking at data on what additional funding can do in terms of enrollment and graduation. And we project that by the time, just in 10 or 15 years, when this formula is fully funded, by the time it is, it would produce 
2,600 additional university graduates. And those graduates, just the additional ones over the course of their lifetime, would contribute $6.5 billion more in state taxes that they would pay. So we believe, yes, $1.4 billion is a big price tag. We also know that, or we believe that this will be decisive in terms of how much tax revenue we have in the future um, and how we can invest in our students in the future, how robust and inclusive our economy is. We think that this will actually be pivotal for the future of our state uh, to have that kind of robust and inclusive economy. Um, so with that, I think we have some time for questions. Uh, I think we have, we have five minutes for questions maybe. Uh, and I think we have two microphones if anyone wants to get up and, and ask. listen to as we build this model and we look at the diversity of the institutions such as a D1 research institution versus an institution like Governor State. We have a small amount of resources that we generate based upon what the state gives us. So what are we suggesting as mechanisms for tracking our success other than the six year graduation rate those types of things which we have to report to the federal government as well but internally statewide what would be key um, indicators that push the institution forward to better support students that's my question I don't know if you have thoughts either but um, yeah, okay I can start um, so I think first the reporting is key right we need to have good data and uniform data everybody reporting the same things in the same ways in order to make this formula work. Uh, that's something we need to establish pretty much, you know, as this formula gets off the ground. Um, and uh, I also think we want to do that. We're striking a balance there in the least onerous way to institutions because they're already being asked to report a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, so I think we want to take stock of what they're being asked to report and how to report that. Um, so in terms of how to report that, I think we have to, both be like aggressive in that, but also careful. Um, I think in terms of what metrics we'll look at, I, I talked about how excited I am about the accountability, the possibility for this accountability model. I think that it's, to be totally honest, the, the, the area that needs to be baked the furthest. I think we really need to think as a state, how do we connect our state goals to our institutional goals? And then from those goals, how do you distill KPIs exactly like what you're saying? I have thoughts on what those KPIs could be, but I think it's much more important than me standing up here being like early momentum indicators, you know, credits earned, credits attempted, whatever. I think it's more important that institutions in the state get together and think about that really hard with stakeholders uh, to build up those um, accountability metrics. So uh, th that's how, yeah, Evan. And uh, one thing I'll add to that is that um, in the report from the commission that this funding formula is based off of, there was a table of suggested metrics and it's a full table, I won't list the whole thing for you, but included in it, there were leading and lagging indicators, things such as uh, the percentage of freshmen who were on time to degree by the end of their freshman year. Something that gets it, lets us know ahead of time how they are progressing in their, um, in their time uh, at, at the university, as well as metrics that really hone in on affordability, specifically affordability for Pell or MAP recipient students, students at different income brackets. Again, trying to recognize we know what the problems are. How can we find, how can we uh, mold metrics to better focus on how big this problem is continuing to be? And as we see this problem diminish, for example, affordability improving for low income students, we can have faith or we can have trust that then that issue is, is less of a burden or less of an obstacle for those students to persist and graduate. Uh, and many of those metrics were built with uh, the onerousness in mind, recognizing how much new data is needed for us to, for, for universities to be able to report to us. You all actually kind of answered it because my question is around the metrics themselves being in, inequitable, mm -hmm. like enrollment number, graduation rates, like there's so much mm -hmm. that's problematic with those, with like those metrics themselves. Uh, I'll, and I'll name that something in the metrics that are included across in across the board, generally speaking, 
are disaggregates to better appreciate what are the equity gaps, not just what are the top line numbers for a university as a whole, but how do we better understand how different student groups and student demographics are doing so that we ensure that universities are, that this rising tide truly lifts our boats. It's not simply one that crashes others at the benefit of some students. All right, we have another question here. And then moving forward, when you ask a question, name and who you're representing. Carlos Ferran, I am here at Governor State University. I fully understand the idea of uniformity. Uh, it's important to kind of use it so that uh, everybody reports all of those things. At the same time, we are very different institutions mm -hmm. and we must stay as different institutions because we're serving different type of students, yes. different types of communities and the projects that we would be implementing would be quite different. In fact, I would argue that the projects should come from the bottom down and not from the top down. Sorry, from the bottom up and not from the top down so that we can really accomplish them. Because if it's just from the top down, then as we know, that often doesn't work. So if a institutions are that different, if institutions are going to be doing different projects, how are you trying to find those uniform measures to, to do that? Because it's kind of contradictory there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, I think it's a, a really good question. I, I think there are numerous things in the formula that address mission. Um, the different missions of different institutions and recognizing that not all um, institutions are alike. And um, so yeah, there, there are specific elements of the formula that I think get at this question. Uh, I think that it's also, you know, of there, there's a lot of different goals that we're, we're getting at with this legislation. And one of them is to fund institutions with recognition of that mission. There's also, you know, the core goals of adequacy uh, and equity and stability. I think that those core goals, we can't let mission be the enemy of those either. So I think something that we've had an eye on throughout the commission is making sure that um, we're not just kind of throwing up our hands and saying, hey, like all institutions are different. Like we are really looking into the metrics and saying, where are we, where are students underfunded in terms of like their core elements that help with their success? So I think it's something we have to continue to balance, um, but also want to make sure uh, that um, we keep our kind of core goals in mind. And uh, I'll add one piece specifically looking at accountability and transparency. Um, <clears throat> in the holistic review, there's also this understanding that there are some institutions for whom they have been underfunded so dramatically. I mean, NEIU is at 39% adequacy. What could we expect a university that has less than half of what they need um, to, what can we expect them to do at that level compared to one that has 92% of adequacy? And so as uh, in this accountability and transparency, there was an awareness that there are some institutions for whom adequacy needs to improve so that, and then it's in the improvement that we want to see um, <clears throat> gaps closing and that we want to keep an eye on, first of all, overall thing, uh, overall rates improving, but we recognize that equity gaps at some institutions are not as dramatic as at other institutions. Uh, there are some institutions that are well resourced and frankly have had the, uh, the ability to ensure that these gaps are not as, as big as they are, but yet have not done that work. And so the accountability on them is really as you're getting these resources, how are you driving these resources to close these equity gaps? And so I see that as there, there are different camps in which different universities sit in and, and what does growth look for them, look like for them? And so that's why part of the holistic, that's why the holistic review board was so important so that it wasn't that everybody is expected to grow by 5% uniformly, but rather a recognition of where are you starting from? What is your adequacy percentage? What are the gaps that your institution has? And then uh, looking at this sort of matrix of challenges and opportunities, how is this university sort of progressing? Uh, which is, I think, why the holistic review panel is so important as a part of the accountability um, outline. 
All right, we have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Joy Patterson. I'm the Chief Diversity Officer here at Governor State University. May I offer a suggestion? Please. This past year, we submitted what was the first state mandated equity plan. We already had an equity plan in place, but now we know that we have a state mandated plan. Mm -hmm. We could easily align the two where we've already identified our areas of improvement. We've identified our barriers mm -hmm. and we have to create a strategic plan of how we are going to improve and then we work that plan. So we actually have something in place mm -hmm. that can hold us accountable and to Dr. Stanley point and some others, is specific to the university. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's just a suggestion that we can align the two. I think that is an excellent point. Honestly, the perfect point to go out on because I think that totally does represent um, how we need to build these goals together and work together, you know, beyond the passing and even funding of this formula to make sure that all of our students succeed. So with that, I think I will uh, introduce uh, Dr. Lisa Castillo-Richmond uh, to uh, move us to the panel discussion. Hello everyone and welcome again. Um, I wanna thank my colleagues for setting the stage so well for us. They have given that presentation in different forms many, many times over the years and you guys are getting really good. So thank you for laying out the problem and the solution and I am really happy to bring up a really distinguished panel of different vantage points and viewpoints on this issue. I'm gonna make sure I have tons of questions, but I'm gonna make sure I leave time for all of you to ask questions and make comments. I know we didn't get to everyone um, during that last segment that had questions. I know things were marinating and people wanted to ask questions, so please do save those. We'll make sure we save time here. So I'm gonna ask the panelists to go on ahead um, and come up and get seated, um, and then I will introduce them. Um, but I'm gonna introduce myself first. As Mike mentioned, I am Lisa Castillo-Richmond. I have the great pleasure of serving as the Executive Director of the Partnership for College Completion. I'm having a lot of nostalgia, um, as Christian mentioned earlier, being in this room. Uh, we got started with our first report as an advocacy organization and presented here um, more than seven years ago, actually. Um, and I am a steadfast and unapologetic advocate for higher education. Um, but at my heart, I am just a first generation college student who grew up in the very northern part of our state from a long line of blue collar workers um, who still live in this state, live in the Rockford area. Um, and actually, it's, it's really exciting to be here at this point in the juncture because last year we did have a number of community conversations like this when the commission was still meeting um, to work towards setting forth some recommendations that did get set forth in March of this year and did get put into the bill that we're talking about today, House Bill 3965, Senate Bill SB 3965. Um, and one of those community conversations while we were trying to build awareness about these issues, the problem and the potential solution that the commission could come forward with, we did do in Rockford. and so. I had the chance, my parents were in the room and I had the chance to sit down and explain that to them while they were there as well, which was really meaningful to me because I think higher education touches all of us. It used to be different, but now higher education touches all our families. I've never met a colleague, a friend, a partner in this work who doesn't have a story about how community colleges and public universities and private nonprofit institutions have touched their families. And so this is something that affects all of us. We have several proud public university graduates on our team, among our partners. We have someone on our team who graduated not too long ago from Governor's State on our data and research team, Giselle, is here in the room. And as I mentioned that, yes, round of applause. And as I mentioned that to some other colleagues, they said, yeah, my brother goes here. My mom graduated from Governor's State. 
And so I just want to drive that point home. You're going to hear that from the diverse perspectives represented on our panel as well. Um, and as we've gone across the state, people are getting excited about this, but we need all of your support. Um, and that is the point of this conversation here today as well, to get down to what we need to do uh, to get this passed. And I must say that there is a lot of national attention on this issue as well as a potential solution and a way to fund public institutions in the years ahead. And so I say that to say that while this funding formula will impact communities all the way from DeKalb down to Carbondale, from Macomb to Chicago, and down to, as Dr. Green would say, President Green, the jewel of the Southland, Governor State, <laughs> it will also affect potentially communities across the country. So what we do here really matters, um, and we need everyone here to do this. So I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists and have a lot of questions for them. Um, but first, we have Representative Carol Ammons of the 103rd, 103rd District, um, representing Champaign. She has been a fierce leader for higher education and for equity across the education continuum in the House, um, just about a little bit longer than the PCC has been in existence, and has been uh, an incredible partner. Our most important work has been engaged with you directly in House Bill 2170, a um, significant equity bill uh, led by the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus. We have President Robin Staines from Advance Illinois, a steadfast partner in advocacy work. We have Brett Porter, a student at Governor State University. We have Dr. Corey Bradford, who is the VP for Finance Administration here at GSU. We have Dr. Teresa Dixon, the CEO of the Gloria J. Taylor Foundation. And we have Veronica Nieves, Senior Director of Postsecondary Success at One Goal, one of the important college access and success organizations here in the state of Illinois. So I want to go ahead and get started with the first question um, that I'm going to start with Representative Ammons um, and then volley to Robin. What are some, what, what are you most excited about with this bill and what are the challenges that you foresee in trying to get this legislation to the finish line? Well, good morning. Um, thank you to Governor State University for hosting this listening session. Um, this is a very big work. And the commission, uh, which I encourage all of you to read the commission's actual report. It'll fill in the blanks, certainly if you're interested in higher education funding, how it works. I I'm gonna tell you that I learned the most about this. Most of us don't know the in, I think the, the, the real intimate, the deep details of funding higher education until we set this commission to kind of really look at it. Illinois is one of very few states that actually has a, uh, doesn't have a funding formula. What we have been doing has been based on some baked in strategy from decades ago, where we were okay as a country with disenfranchising whole communities, and we funded schools in that way for a very, very long time. And not even until 1954 did you start seeing some movement to really get people into higher education, certainly in a large number from African-American communities. You have you know, a scholar here and there that we could name, but the reality is most of the African-American community was locked out of higher education for a very long time. So now we come fast forward to Illinois and we saw what happened in 2020. I think that what happened when we began to work on House Bill 2170, um, we decided to look very deeply into how we fund education in the state of Illinois. Now I'm from Urbana-Champaign and I understand that in Illinois we have made institutions kind of cannibalize each other. We are every, I'm on appropriations higher ed, they come in, they say, Here's what we need, oh please help us. We need 12%, you need 5%, but we're gonna give everybody three. And you guys figure it out. That has been, I believe, the number one driver in the inequities across the board. 
if I have more adult learning students, a mom with three children, and she also has a job, but she's at Governor State in the evening trying to finish a degree from 20 years ago, that's very different than the high schooler who just graduated from high school last week. That's very, very different. And so we tend to sometimes ignore those adult learners, but it revealed that we have a cliff coming we better pay attention to. And then secondly, without you know, taking the, the scholarship of this lady away in any way, shape, or form, I began to understand how um, baked in the inequalities are. And so the challenges I think we will face is people are comfortable with what they know. That, that's the number one thing. Most people are very comfortable with what they know, and they don't want to feel like they're losing anything. Now, those two have been the drivers of a lot of disparities in every industry, and I can name them all and prove it. What we are asking people to do is reimagine how we fund higher education, and just imagine if we really did remove barriers that have been kind of baked in for a long time and say, well, if GSU needs this, let us make sure that we can help them do that. I'll say in, in closing on this particular question that we were in appropriations committee one year, maybe a year ago within this term, and one of our institutions had begun um, negotiation and bargaining with their support staff. I believe support staff should always be supported in any kind of funding process of the universities. I believe it. And if we don't provide that and build that in and consider that, then we are kind of losing the focus, right, because those uh, workers are essential at those universities. So they came to us during this cycle. They had a huge issue at that university to try to settle that contract. And it was so difficult that even today, the infrastructure plan that they had, they couldn't exercise because they had to, they had to finish that contract. So we are always making our universities have to kind of rob Peter, pay Paul, and maybe we don't pay Paul until next year, but we will rob Peter this year. We, we should change that and make it an actual, actionable, equitable model that is sustainable, dependable, and people can actually rely on it. Yes. Same question for Robin. So I, I, I will try to fill in um, places because I completely agree with everything Representative Ammon said. What I'm most excited about, and Lisa mentioned it, and I hope it's shown forth in, uh, in what Mike and Eo were sharing with you. This is something that has not been tried anywhere in the country. When people move from a politically driven, everybody just goes and individually says, here's what I need, and there's really no rationale for why we give what we give. We got more, we'll do this with it. Most people move to performance-based funding, and honestly, when we first stood up this commission, I thought that's where we would end up doing, right? You get better results on the things we care about, we give you more money. Two big problems with that. One, you gotta have money to get the better results. We know that we've got institutions at 39%, governor states 45%, 52%. Who are you privileging when you say, well, when you get better results, then we'll give you more money? The people who have more money in the first place that they can make some of those changes. So it's a backwards way to approach it. The second problem is people can game it. You tell me what the outcomes are you want, maybe I'll just, you know, you want better graduation rates, maybe I'll change who it is that I am enrolling which is exactly the opposite of what we want. And what we are learning and what we learned in the commission in listening to states that have been doing that for 10 to 15 years is they're going back to the drawing board. It's not working for the reasons we've just said. And so we had to do something different. And the beauty is having done the evidence-based formula, having changed K-12 funding, and starting with an adequacy-based approach that was student-centered, we kind of had another way of thinking about it, which is, well, what do institutions actually need? Given the students they're serving, given their unique mission, given state priorities and objectives, what do they need? Now that's a much more complicated thing to figure out, I'm here to tell you at the post-secondary level, than it is in K-12, where the models are very different and you've gotta take a lot more things into account. It costs different amounts to run an engineering program than it does to run an English program. Graduate versus undergraduate. Research one versus research three, which is why it took the commission a little longer to do its work, but it turns out you can figure that stuff out. You can figure out that if you spend different amounts on student support, you can get, you can serve a wide range of students very effectively. And we now know how to quantify that. But the thing that I'm the most excited about, so this is being watched nationally, and I think this is the trend the whole country is gonna go in. So go Illinois for getting in there and putting this to the test. But the other thing I'm excited about the game changer is once we understand how differentially 
the funding is going out, that we know that we've got everything from 39 and 45 percent funding adequacy to 92. You can't unsee that. And so I think the challenge that Representative Ammons mentioned is the one that's most on my mind. It is hard. This is a significant change. And significant change is hard. Status quo is easy. It has a huge gravitational pull. But what makes me hopeful is that we're two things. One, what we're already hearing, the commission came out with its report, there were a bunch of hearings in the House and the Senate, listening sessions around the state, and the people who are responsible for leading that charge were all saying the same thing. God, we can't keep doing what we're doing. We cannot keep doing what we're doing. That's critically important. Once everybody's there, then it's, okay, what are our options? And we've done the work. We have put multiple years in, we have done exhaustive research, we have listened, we have studied, we have analyzed. But if once people understand you can't keep doing what you're doing, once people understand that you've got everything from 39% to 92%, you can't stay where you are. And so I think that's going to be a huge challenge to make the change, but I think we've got the right things in place to do it. So I am hopeful about that. Thank you. Brett, this question is for you as a current student. So as you saw in the prior presentation, some of the goals of this formula is adequate, equitable, and sustainable funding for all of our public universities. What has been your experience with the financial aid process and affordability more broadly? Because that is one of the goals that we're trying to address here for students as well. I think that choosing Governor State had to do with making sure that I could financially come back, leave my job, uh, because I knew my experience as a student the first time going around, um, I did not do well. I, I left school. Um, I knew that I had to be a full-time student. So this time around, I knew I was coming back full-time. I was not going to work full-time. I have a, a very part-time job that I see Christian at sometimes when I play basketball with him. Uh, but uh, filling out FAFSA was very simple. Um, but in the end, the amount of money that they gave me was not enough. Um, without my parents being able to loan me a large sum of money, I would not have made it through the first year uh, without piling up a, a very large debt. Um, so I think that it can be very difficult for students that don't have the opportunity to go to their parents. I, I do have, I am privileged that I can do that. So I think that we do need to help those that don't have these resources. Thank you. This question is for you, Dr. Bradford. I'm going to loop back to you, Representative Ammons. Um, what do you think is among the most important things that the communities you serve understand about this bill and about this effort overall? Well, good morning. Um, I think for far too long, we have witnessed the consequences of an outdated funding system. Uh, we had a great decline in state support for our institutions. We saw the rising cost of tuition, placing the undue burden on our students and our families. We've also seen the struggles of many underrepresented students to gain access to college, but even more important, to complete college. So we can't afford to maintain the status quo. Uh, the time for bold action is now. Illinois can lead the nation in, in providing this new model. The proposed new state funding formula for our public universities represent a transformational opportunity to address some long-standing inequities and to propel our state forward uh, uh, as a leader in higher education. So I think that's what we need to be communicating to our communities, that they understand that this is real change that we're talking about. Thank you. Um, I would just add that um, I'm from Urbana-Champaign, um, our flagship university, which enrolls and educates thousands of students <laughs> every year in our state, which is doing an amazing job with that. What my community understands already, though, is that even though they may live right down the street from that university, the reality is most of their children won't go there. And I can statistically prove that, and so the university would uh, agree with me on that. Because the number one thing that we experienced when we went 
through listening sessions on developing the commission itself, was that everyone understood affordability. They just understood it. We can look at the economy currently and understand that a person who may have spent $115 this week at the grocery store spent $230 this week at the grocery store. We've, we've increased costs in so many different areas that people are starting to say, oh, I gotta work full time. Like the young man said he couldn't, he couldn't do it, I gotta work full time. Everyone doesn't have the opportunity for someone to be able to help them as he suggested his parents are able to help him or I may be able to help my son get through college. But a lot of us, just by demographics, can't do that. So my community understands that even though the flagship sits right in the middle of it. We also have to make sure that communities understand that the way we currently fund will always maintain inequities. If we are okay with that, and to those who are in this room that are representing different groups, I know you have interest groups that you're concerned about. And the interest of your group has to include the overall objective of reaching an equitable and sustainable model. If that is not the objective, you can continue to come to the Appropriations Higher Ed Committee and you can make your case and then we will go back and say, well, this is all that we can come up with and good luck. Or we can say, let's start working on a formula, let's build a process, let's correct it if it doesn't work exactly the way we thought it should work. We've done lots of bills with leader at, um, Will Davis, who's in this room on EBF, because what they did in EBF is made sure they had a continuous review. That is part of our accountability measure. So my community has to understand that even when we do this, even when we put in place a funding formula that is transparent and people can truly understand, we will have to continue to perfect it because everything in, I don't think I've ever passed a perfect bill, but perhaps I did. <laughs> but, you know, maybe somebody does, but I don't think I do. We've done trailer bill after trailer bill after trailer bill for all kinds of things because things don't always work out the way we envision them. But our goal overall is to make sure that high school graduation class that comes next doesn't have to decide, I live down the street but I really can't go there. I need to go elsewhere, either out of state, or I need to go downstate who doesn't have enough support downstate when I visit some of our other campuses. This is very important for us to, to really drive that home in every single community. And let me just say lastly, for those who are in rural areas, rural representation is a really huge deal. When we looked at the demographics uh, from our advocacy groups like Advance and PCC, we realized that rural students are really, really underrepresented, right? It's important for us to not do what some of my colleagues want to do to controversialize this bill. Is this about race? I've already had that question many times. And I'm not gonna lie to people, it is. It's about race as a factor it's about distance as a factor. It's about adequacy as a factor. It's about support services for students as a factor. It's about, right, we have all of these factors that have to go into determining what adequacy actually is for that institution. So we cannot tell people that it's not about race when we see on the graphic the underrepresented minority groups have been baked in to low performance rates for a long time. So I would be lying if I said no. I'm saying to us that we need to come hopefully collectively together as we work on a 20 year or more problem, because I, I believe it's longer than 20 years, but certainly for the last 20 years we have declined in our revenue to higher education institutions, that's a fact. And in the next few years we have an opportunity to build a, a model, a path, that will not do the restriction but to do the investment. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to direct the next question to Veronica and Brett, and this is, you saw in one of those previous charts, um, this formula attempts to calculate what institutions need based on their missions, based on the student population that they actually serve in their institutions for providing academic and non-academic supports. So how have you seen in your work um, academic and non-academic supports be critical to the success of your students across their entire time in higher education? And Brett, for you personally, or as you've seen it as well. Veronica? <clears throat> All right. 
Hello, everyone. Um, so I think, first off, I want to start with just a little background. We know that nationally, students from low-income communities are three times less likely to earn a post-secondary degree than their peers in high-income areas. We also know that nationally, on average, high school students only receive about 38 minutes total across four years of post-secondary advising. So talking to a counselor about what do I want to do after life after graduation. So we at One Goal are looking to transform that and change that through our model of a One Goal class in partnership with high schools and districts across the state of Illinois, where we find teachers to teach students a post-secondary readiness curriculum, a class, junior year, senior year, and that teacher sticks with these students that first year in post-secondary. As a coach, as a mentor, checking in with them academically, socially, financially, how is life after high school graduation going for you? So that's just a little bit of background on what we do at One Goal um, and how we really help students understand and research um, their options. So we look at academic match. So we help students understand what is my selectivity, what does my GPA mean, what options are available to me, um, and we help them apply to a specific number of match schools, overmatch schools, because we know that if an institution is an academic match for students, they are more likely to persist. They are more likely to have academic services and supports on campus to support students at that academic level. We also encourage students to look at an institution's six-year underrepresented minority graduation rate because that also is an indicator that the institution's doing something right, that they have some supports in place for underrepresented minority students. So that's on the research side, and that's how we help students when they're juniors create their lists of where do I want to apply after I graduate from high school. But specifically, you know, we know that it's not only, all right, I applied to these seven schools, I'm done. I think the next step that we guide students through is ensuring that they are looking into completion support programs, um, like a first year seminar, a first gen or identity based group at the institution, a trio program, a chance, um, a, a basically a program like a peer mentorship program, but some additional supplemental program um, like we were talking about earlier, people were talking about these non-academic supports that institutions may not have the funding for, or they had these programs and then they had to kind of disinvest in them because of a lack of funding. And we've seen that at our partner campuses that we work with. We partner with colleges and universities um, and build relationships with them to ensure that our students seamlessly enroll at these institutions and we can kind of hand off our One Goal students to the champions at these campuses, but we know that University staff are also at capacity. Their teams are at capacity. Sometimes they don't have the funding to add additional staff to their teams to support with CBO, community-based partnerships. Um, and we know that there's an inundation of community-based organizations out there, like a One Goal, a Bottom Line, a Chicago Scholars, Hope Chicago, that I think they're all talking to the same people at the institution, and sometimes that one staff member is overwhelmed. They're like, I'm doing this on top of my job. And so I think um, I would just say that I think, you know, ensuring that students are seeking out completion support programs, we know that that really ensures that they, um, they're connecting those dots, not only to, okay, I'm going to apply to these schools, I'm going to enroll, I'm going to access, but also thinking about, okay, what is going to kind of bolster the quality of my enrollment and what are the programs at the institution that I should be looking into to help increase my likelihood of persisting. And on the institution side, I think it's that part, continuing to, to invest in partnerships with community-based organizations because we are here to support students, but also I think um, making sure that, those, that, that there's funding available for university staff and teams to en enact some of these completion support programs or peer mentorship programs. Thank you, Brett? As I said, I am I, was, I am a returning student, so I do have a unique perspective in that I have two different experiences coming to college. Uh, when I was 18 to 21, I was at college. I was not engaged, not motivated, didn't reach out, wasn't participating in campus. And uh, when I was put on academic probation, I just left school. I got a job at the casino and was like happy to do that. Um, but now that I'm back, I have a very different experience. Uh, after working for eight years and basically making enough to live but not gain anything, um, 
I wanted to be very involved in school. So I took a different approach. Um, right now I'm the vice president of the Drone Engineering Club, the Innovation Club, Student Senate, Site Club, and Tau Sigma National Honor Society. I also just started the software engineering program, um, or software engineering club. Um, so I'm very involved in campus and I do see all of these resources that our students can use, but a lot of students don't have t the time that I have. If they have to work, uh, if they have more of a social life, uh, they're not on campus. They're not going to all these events and learning about what they can get here. Um, and honestly, we have a lot of great staff at Governor State. They go above and beyond in their roles. We have someone that used to be the leader of the clubs and organizations, and now he's in charge of Greek life on top of that because they have not filled that role. Uh, we have academic advisors that have way too much on their plates. Um, and it's just hard to keep up with everyone. They're doing a great job, but staff retention is very important. And if we don't have the funds for that, it's going to be hard for those people to just do more than they're supposed to. Um, we also lack funds for things like recreation and facilities. Um, a lot of our resources are going to the athletes and they're not even getting enough resources. Our soccer team drives out to Indiana to practice and play. Um, uh, we have career services that helps with resumes, but the opportunities are, are, are limited. It's just what it is. Um, I think that I spent the summer at Notre Dame at an internship uh, on NASA funded projects and that was a gift. Uh, I applied for probably 70 internships and I didn't re get a response from any of them. Um, so I had a staff member uh, who's in charge of the Drone and Engineering Club that helped me get this internship. But I think that if we have the funds, we can have internships at Governor State that can help these students get experience for work life. Um, and academically, we also have uh, staff issues with our teachers, our, our professors. We have, um, we have classes being canceled because the staffing issues. So there's just a lot of issues that um, I think the funding could help. Absolutely, and I think you both illustrated so powerfully how all of these things are st so human-centered and take resources. And when you think about Governor State being funded at 45% adequacy, think about that. Like, what does that mean every single semester for students on campus? Dr. Dixon, this question is for you. How has access and affordability affected students you have worked with in terms of their transition to college, their college choice, and how they maneuver through college? Good morning. Um, for me, I run TRIO programs. Those who are familiar with TRIO, we're funded through the United States Department of Education. So we have two local bands for education and talent search. So we're fortunate that we're able to expose our students to all type of colleges, PWIs, HBCU, large, small, so they can know exactly what the best college fit for them. Um, the challenges we have been facing is that we serve under, underserved, underrepresented students, and they don't want to put a burden of finances on their families. Dr. Dixon, could you go closer to the mic? Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, good. Thank you. So they don't want to burden their families or they can't burden their families to get money for schooling. So they're going to go to an institution that provides them with, uh, with free tuition um, or any place that's going to minimize whatever they have to do to pay for their college education. We found, um, unfortunately, state out, neighboring states, they provide free tuition or match in-state tuition because they can't afford to go to a lot of Illinois state schools. So that's what... Um, We've been looking at making sure that our students are able to go to college, but I would love for them to be able to go to colleges they really want to go to and not just because they can go there for free. You want them to be able to enjoy their post-secondary education and not just go because they don't want to be a burden to their family or their family can't afford for them to go. So those are the things that we uh, have faced. We've been very successful even with some of our students going to school in Illinois, um, helping them provide scholarships, helping them to find work study, helping them to find that balance in school. Because we have had students to go away, even though tuition was free, it wasn't for them. So sometimes you can get the free education, but if it's not the right fit, you're not gonna be successful. And with TRIO, our goal is not only to get them in school, but to make sure they graduate so they can become productive and positive citizens in our communities. Even those who do go away, we encourage them to come back in the summer to take classes at their local institution to burden some of that debt and to help them graduate, and also come back home and, and give back to the community that they grew up in. So those are some of the things that we look at 
you know, we're trying to get our students in college. Thank you so much. Okay, so this question is for all of you. I want to keep my promise and make sure we have some time for comments and questions from the audience, so get ready. Um, I'm going to just ask all of you the same question here, which is call to action. So the name of this event is The Time Is Now, and we could take 10 years to pass this funding formula. We do not want to do that, right? Time is of the essence. So if you had to leave everyone in this room with a call to action or something that you just are burning to say that you haven't had a chance to say yet, what do we most need to get this bill passed and enacted? And how can the folks in this room help us? Representative? Well, I would say, um, you know, this, I believe, is uh, certainly in my generation, because I'm a little bit older, but once in a lifetime opportunity. We have an opportunity to change the way that we provide higher education to the people of Illinois. We have an opportunity. It's whether we decide that it's, it's not appropriate for us to have institutions so far away from adequacy. Is that appropriate in Illinois? My call to action for you would be to, one, if you haven't taken an opportunity to do so, please read the commission's work. Yes, it's complicated, and I'm not gonna tell you I can break down the entire technical report. I'm not gonna try to do that. But I can tell you that when you get to the numbers and the graphs, they make sense. They are self-explanatory. Some people have a lot more resources to work with than others. That's just what it is. And we get to fix it. So please go read the commission's work. Please provide us with your questions in truth and in transparency. Because as we try to go forward to pass the bill, the bill itself is gonna take a lot of help and a lot of hands for us to pass it. We need you to talk to your representatives wherever you live. If you have rural representatives, please talk to them. And please ascertain what their concerns would honestly be. We go to committee, we want to make sure that we've given everyone an opportunity to weigh in. We don't want anybody to come to committee and say, I, I don't know what they're talking about, I've never heard of this before. They just, they passed this bill in 24 hours. You know, we want to eliminate that as the discussion, which is why we are having these discussions across the state. So if we can be partners, let's be partners, let's read the report, let's ask truthful questions. How can we implement this? We don't want to harm, we want to help, and we hope that you will too. Thank you, Robin. Be heard. Getting the commission up and running was a push. Usually it is, and I've been doing this long enough, usually you can get a commission up because people are like, well, I'll just ignore the results. It was hard to even get the commission stood up. That means this is gonna require, if your legislators don't know that you're watching and that you care, it's gonna be very easy, much easier not to take action than to take action. So please call your legislators. More importantly, tell everybody you know about this. Get them to pay attention, get them to make calls. Make sure that legislators know you're watching. Because there's two fights. One is to pass the bill, but the second is we gotta fund it. What the bill is gonna call for, what the commission calls for is $135 million a year. Because one of the things, and you heard Mike and Neob speaking of this, is you want enough money going out the door that everybody can deal with inflation so we're not passing those costs on. But you gotta, everybody's gotta do okay, but some institutions at 39%, 45%, 52% gotta do better. And for that to work, we gotta get $135 million or more into this formula every year for the next 10 or 11 years. So we got two fights on our hands. People need to know it's a priority to pass it and to fund it and to fund it at 135 million or more. And they're only gonna do that if they believe people are watching and care and prepared to make some noise about it. Can I add a sentence before you go on to the $135 million, if we look mathematically, we know higher education pays. It pays dividends. That's what we all agree with. We wouldn't be here if it didn't. But if we spend 135 million additional dollars in higher ed, and our, our outcomes, as this chart showed us, that we can generate billions of dollars off of the 135 million dollars, sounds like something we should probably do. It's an do. investment, it's not an a investment. cost, it's an investment. Yeah, that one billion dollars can turn into six billion, I think, in that chart. And also, you saw the most staggering charts. I saw a bunch of people take out their cameras. Illinois used to be around the national average in investing 
in higher ed. And now we're down, way down in the 2% of our state revenue goes to higher ed. That's not okay. Brett. Uh, I would say just to leave a legacy, even though it might not help me or even my friends that are in school now, it'll help those in the, in the future. And I would say that inaction is choosing the wrong side. Dr. Bradford. Yeah, uh, my call would be, of course, advocacy from all stakeholder groups. I think their strength in unity, their strength in numbers, and people need to hear your voices. You know, what makes me hopeful about this new funding model is it's not just a redistribution of funds. You know, that's how a lot of the other states have done their model. They just redistributed funds. What this model is talking about is an investment in Illinois' higher education system. So for our students, what we're talking about is improved access, improved affordability, more support services that will lead to higher retention and higher graduation rates. For our institutions, this is, we're talking about financial stability, predictable funding that will ensure your long-term planning capacity building and innovation. And for our economy and our communities, we're talking about building a better educated workforce that will drive economic growth in your communities and that will make Illinois more competitive on a national stage. There's no reason we should be a net exporter of students. Our students should be able to go to an uh, in-state institution and receive the education that they need. You can go to Indiana and get a cheaper education than you can in Illinois, or Missouri, or Wisconsin. You pick a state, you will find that it's more affordable for them to go out of state in some cases. And then for our employees, this model is important because it provides adequate funding for all institutions to provide a fair wage, a competitive benefit packages for all faculty and for all staff. And so we need to be invested in making this happen across the board. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dixon? I just want to echo what Dr. Bradford said, but as I think about my role in when I'm looking at institutions to send my students, I'm always looking at graduation rates. So how are your graduation rates high? That means you have programs and services and funding to help students while they're there. I wanna make sure my students get what they need to excel. When they're having a mental health issue, when they're having a crisis, there's someone there to talk to them, there's program, there's services. Um, something that has not been talked about, but there's a high increase of suicide rate among students that are trying to go to school because, and they don't have anyone to talk to at the institutions. There needs to be more funding, and hopefully this bill covers that as well. I have students that are away always calling me, well, my friend committed suicide, my friend tried to commit suicide, and there was no one there for them to talk to. One young lady at the institution was on the wait list to see a counselor, and she didn't make the wait list. So this is very important. These are things that we have to put into our place for our kids to be successful. Um, again, as I'm looking at graduation rates and knowing what's best for my kids, I would love for our students to stay in Illinois and be a part of Illinois and give back to Illinois. And that's what we should do. Um, so if, as we continue to talk with our legislators, continue to talk with our communities, continue to be a wraparound service and all of us come together for the one common goal, I think this can be successful. It's gonna take some time. But as long as we're moving forward, as long as the curb bill is going up and not up and down, up and down, I think it can be very successful. Thank you. Thank you. Veronica? <clears throat> All right, I'll close us out. <laughs> um, I think really what I would urge and encourage us all in the room to do is to continue to capture and tell the realities of what our students are facing at a variety of colleges and universities across the state of Illinois. I think um, a a statistic at one goal or you know one of the numbers um, is that we we were able to survey a group of students a few years back where um, we were noticing that they continue to stop out they were stopping out at large rates so we were trying to do some focus groups with them and understand the what's the root cause of stopping out and the number one 72 percent of our respondents said that the number one reason was financial barriers so we also try to help students understand what is a financially fit 
post-secondary institution for me, what's financially feasible for myself and for my family. And so I would just continue to urge us um, to ensure that we're educating our young people and our families around financial fitness, financial feasibility. And it's not just about the total cost of tuition and room and board and fees, but what are the supplemental um, aspects? What other essentials at these campuses are they providing to students, like food pantries, wellness, um, all sorts of other services that really help a student's full well-being to be an active student. Um, because this financial barrier is not going away. This semester, we have staff visiting Illinois State, Northern Illinois, meeting with our freshmen, and about 50 freshmen all ex ex expressed, oh, can you help me find some more financial support, financial services? We surveyed our first years. A, half of 100 respondents, again, said, can you please connect me with more financial resources? So keep educating our young people around financial fitness and continue to capture and tell the stories of the, the realities our students are facing. Thank you so much. We are going to transition to comments and questions now, but I want to give a first round of applause to our amazing panel that hit so many good points. Carlos Ferran, professor here at Governor State and proud member of UPI. Uh, Representative Amundsen, I agree with your ideas. However, I have to disagree with one point that you made. I live in a neighborhood where almost nobody believes what you stated. They don't believe that education is an investment for the state. They don't believe that education is an investment at all, but an expense. It's a fight that I have continuously with my neighbors. And I think that that's something that we really have to work hard because a large number of people in our state and in our country believe that because they paid for their education, then the next generation also needs to pay for their education. Like in the military, if they treated me badly, I need to treat the next one badly. Instead of, I was treated badly, but I'll treat the next generation better. I truly believe that education should be free because it's the best investment that I can make in the future. I gain from an educated neighbor, and I try to tell that to my neighbors. <laughs> but it's a really difficult sell. They truly believe that because they pay for it, so do their children need to pay for it, not the state. <laughs> and I think that's what we need to do right now. We need to try to convince all our neighbors that we gain from that. That cell that was placed on that slide, that it's a really great investment that pays more than the stock market. You know, not just because it's the just thing to do. Because some people, unfortunately, don't care about the just thing to do. They care about, you know, the capitalistic way of doing it. And this is just just and a great investment. And we need to go with both arguments to our neighbor on the le left, our neighbor on the right, our neighbor in the front, and our neighbor in the back. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate you. Um, and I agree with you that trying to convince people who hasn't had an opportunity that this helps them is part of the work. However, I have had this conversation with people as well, and I can tell them that the cost of higher education, that we're trying to remedy that factor, because I agree with you. If I could, in this General Assembly, pass tuition-free higher ed, I would. I would. I know that we haven't done enough to get us there yet, right? But I also have to respond to the moment that we're in, we're actually in. And if 
accessing higher ed outpaces my credit card costs, right? We have to reverse that. You're right. This should not be a net gain loss for the person who says, am I going to school or am I just going to, you know, try to make it however I can? We want to answer that it is a net positive for you because if you graduate from high school, you can do okay. But we don't have the economy of 1920. That's just not where we are. And we don't have the workforce of 1920 where a high school graduated degree could get you a not only living wage job of that day, but you could also advance in a career. That doesn't exist anymore because the economy that we actually live in, the workforce that we actually live with, is one that requires increasingly more a college degree to work in it. And if we lock out people based on cost, we can never get to the workforce solution we're looking for. So I agree with you, I appreciate your candor, um, I would love to pass the tuition free. I would love to follow the uh, industrialized world who's already been doing this for many decades for their uh, citizens and their countries. We have decided a different path and in this path, we have to do everything we can to remove that being the reason, meaning cost. Uh, Jessica McDonald, I'm here representing the IBHE Faculty Advisory Council. Um, this is related more to the calls to action, but we have a request just to continue keeping faculty voices really heavily involved. We all need more support on the academic support staff, but it is crucial that those staff work directly with faculty members because we're dealing with students one-on-one -on -one in the classroom, and we're also providing that support. Um, and even the language in the bill, there's some places where it says, inclusion on some of those committees of representatives of faculty members. We'd like faculty members to be there also representing those voices. So just as you're speaking with your constituents, with your groups, just keeping in mind that <coughs> faculty members want to be part of it. We want our voices to be part of this because we support the funding that's happening. Um, so just keep talking to those faculty members as well because we're here to support students. That's why our jobs exist. That's what we keep wanting to do. So uh, we just hope to keep those faculty representations included in those committees as these new um, bills and amendments continue to move forward. Questions, comments? This is awesome. We got through everything, which never ha happens. Um, I just want to add one comment to, to your comment. I think it is incumbent upon all of us to have these conversations. Like we, I have had so many, just like you have, and Representative Ammons. I think the reality is, and I think you see this in some of the discourse about higher ed, why people have lost confidence in the past 10 years in higher education. Some of it is just false narrative, right? It's disingenuous. In, in some of these public discourse, but some of it is real. You know, we have so many students who haven't been able to afford college to even start. We have so many students who've had to stop out and have some college and no degree. So we have real people around the state and around the country that have had negative experiences with higher ed and haven't been able to reap the benefits. As you mentioned, the, the student loan debt has exploded. So I think the first step in making sure that we can serve our students well is making sure that they, our institutions have the resources they need while we continue to fund our student need-based aid program as the best way that we can make affordable college, free college, no debt college, all of these things that we want to see that we know are so important for our state, for our students, for our families, for our institutions. So, I encourage all of you to get engaged in that fight in all of the different ways based on the positions that you hold in your life and in your work. Um, and just thank you for being here today. And again, another big round of applause for our distinguished panel. Okay, so I'm gonna invite our panel to be seated and I am going to introduce my colleague, Blanca Hada, Chief of Staff at the Partnership for College Completion. It's still good morning. So good morning, everyone. I'm Blanca. 
Uh, I want to thank everyone today for your incredible engagement. There we go. Uh, incredible engagement, and I want to extend a special thank you to Governor State University, our fantastic panelists, the Coalition for Transforming Higher Education funding, and our dedicated PCC staff for their hard work and collaboration in making this event happen. I encourage you to take the insights and lessons from today and continue to champion change in both our communities and the higher education system. Your voices matter. Whether you're a student, an educator, or community member, your advocacy is key to ensuring equitable opportunities for everyone in the state of Illinois. Today we've seen discussions, groundbreaking insights, and clear pathways for advancing equitable funding for our Illinois public universities. Your participation helps shape the future of higher education and the future of the students in our state, and your continued involvement is extremely crucial. SB 3965 is a game changer. This bill represents an essential shift in how we fund higher education, ensuring equity, adequacy, and access to all of the students, especially those from the undeserved communities. This legislation is not just about funding, it's about transforming lives by ensuring every student, regardless of their background, has the resources they need to succeed and live a fulfilling life. Our communities are at the heart of everything that we do. Together we have the power to create a more just and equitable system for our students and also an opportunity for economic stability for them and their families. We encourage you to continue advocating for this important cause, whether there's through personal action or coalition involvement, your voice adds to the growing momentum of change. Our coalition is a vital force in pushing for policy re reforms like SB 3965. You should all join us to be a part of this network and amplify the message and equity and access. Also amplify the voices of the students and providing all of the resources that they need to be successful. Before you leave, please take a moment to fill out our survey. You can also find the QR code here and, and they should be on, um, on the tables. Your feedback is invaluable and help us refine our strategies and strengthen our collective efforts. Also, don't forget we will be providing lunch before this session is over. Now it's my honor to introduce our closing speaker, Dr. Beverly Schneller, Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs. She has been a champion of educational equity and we are thrilled to have her share her insights as we conclude today's event. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here today with you all and to share these important insights. I think we have all been inspired by the passion, the desires to change represented in our speakers and their strong commitment to the trajectory of student success. As we know, state funding for higher education is a competition from among multiple state priorities depending on the state and on the funding needs, which range from things as broad as healthcare to innovations to infrastructure. As we know, within the larger boundaries of educational funding itself, we need to be mindful and supportive of the needs of K through 12 education, community colleges, and higher education as we find ourselves competing for the same dollars. When state investments, as we have heard today, in higher education decrease, Tensions are placed on the institutions to address the funding gaps and needs of their campuses that manifest themselves in instability and tiered allocations based on key performance indicators that may be set from outside the higher education institutions. Increases in cost of attendance for students. Limitations on institutional flexibility to respond to students' post-COVID learning needs our ability to attract and retain faculty in competitive hiring fields and support increases in financial aid where most of state allocations go. We also experience decreases in student enrollment due to strains that are beyond our control such as FAFSA application issues that affect students' willingness to even engage in the higher education enrollment process. We also see an effort by states to maintain sustainable support for financial aid through programs such as Alabama's Trust Fund Bill 
that increased higher education funding by 84% this year, adding $110 million in new revenue for public colleges. Massachusetts adopted a program for free in-state tuition for families who earn less than $100,000 a year, and the Minnesota North Star Promise increased grants and expanded free tuition programs. All of these have a short shelf life in the end if they are not institutionalized in the budget formulas of the individual states. At the heart of the fund in question is creating an understanding or a better understanding and awareness of the return on investment in public higher education in measuring individual, community, and statewide workforce readiness, economic impact, social mobility, health and wellness, and the promotion of economically and socially sustainable avenues for diversity, equity, and inclusion of all citizens as the true potential of accessible and equitable educational opportunities. The state of Illinois in Senate Bill 3965 has a forceful and formidable opportunity to leverage the power of the state and the power of the people to create a new funding model that is both democratic and democratizing in its outcomes. So let us work together to bring the funding model from a vision to a reality to support the well-being and opportunities of the talented people of our state to attain rewarding and purposeful lives. Thank you.